dear colleagues, good morning. In my contribution, sorry, I have to get acquainted with first technology. In my contribution, I will speak about Roman and Mona from the archaeologist point of view, and I will be comparing and contrasting early Roman and Mona to late Roman and Mona, as I think. Those two could be seen as two quite different cities in both appearance and function. A change, a transformation obviously took place, and my hypothesis here today is that the gradual Christianization of at least a part of the Mona's population was closely linked to this transformation. First, let us get acquainted with the Mona. The city was, as you well know, uh, one of the cities in the western part of the empire uh, that is presented on the left and on the right there is a Mona on the map of modern Slovenia together with other Roman cities and settlements. Uh, and Mona was a Roman colony, that means a city with full rights inhabited with colonists from elsewhere. It was built at the beginning of the first century according to a standard Roman model was a relatively small city with around 3,000 inhabitants and first century brought large urban investments. Those were, oh sorry, followed by, uh, by a crisis from the end of second till the third century connected with Marcomannic Wars during which Amona was to become one of the centers of the military administrative region of Pretentura Italia et Alpium with plague epidemic and economic stagnation. In connection with those factors, there seems to be a drop in the number of inhabitants in the third century as we have declined burials in Emona cemeteries. Then, fourth century brought welfare, renewal of parts of infrastructure and building development in several locations throughout the city. And archaeologically speaking, the city seems to have ended its life around the mid-fifth century. Uh, right. Here we have Emona Tabla Pentigriana. Its position as one of the small towns in this huge empire is marked with a white circle and obviously it was well connected with the network of road to the empire. Uh, now, early Roman Emona, let us take a short look with about see the outline and function of the city. As already mentioned, the Mona was built according to a standard Roman model with rectangular layout, walls with towers, four main city gates and several postern gates, and with a main square form in the center of the city. A Mona's form had, as main forms usually, a temple on one side and the civilian basilica on the other, with shops in between. Around the forum, there were possibly other public buildings, such as Curia. On your right above is a map with a position working. Um, with a position of the forum in Mona's layout. This map will accompany us throughout the lecture to give you some orientation as to where in the city we are at the moment. Our venue is approximately okay. Our venue is uh, <coughs> yes, and there is the identity where the castle hill. Uh, yes, Emona had, early Roman Emona had other features of, so to say, standard public infrastructure such as city gates. And the network of cloaca, the sewer channels running under the streets, collecting waste and leading it into the Udanica River. The river itself was most probably named Don Portus at the time. And the Muna had, at least in some parts of the city, a plumbing system supported by a number of wells. But the city as we know it from the late Roman period seems quite different. Let us first explore those differences and then look into the possible causes. In late Roman Emona, in the 4th and early decades of 5th century, we observed that parts of infrastructure like sewer network and parts of city mode were neglected. 
other part of previously surface city mold was reduct and city walls reinforced at, reinforced at some places. This is on one hand, and on the other, we see a considerable investment into early Christian buildings. Uh, we have two outlet primitive uh, church with baptistery and adjacent buildings, a uh, chapel in the Christian section of Northern Graveyard, Rotunda near the Forum, and together some other possible locations. Uh, let us look those changes in detail. Yes. First, we have this substantial site near the Forum. There, large baths and what appears to be a gambling area was found, dated by the excavation of the Middle mostly on the basis of coin finds to the first half of the 5th century. Close by, Emuna had a public toilet, dated similarly to the end of 4th to early 5th century. On the same site, but a bit earlier, in the second half of the 4th century, a, a rather large, measuring more than 50 square meters, church hall was made, its floor covered with undoubtedly expensive multicolored mosaic. Again, in the second half of the 4th century, in the northwestern part of Emuna, another, a la primitiva with mosaic floor was made soon afterwards. At the end of 4th or beginning of the 5th century, a large and luxurious religious complex containing a baptistery, at least one church, and possibly the premises for the bishop was built. The whole complex turned early Christian center in our archaeological literature. Here, we should know that so, that so-called building inscription from the portico on, on your left states that the Archidiaconos and Diochus had a portico and baptistery built, indicating that at least one church already stood on the site or nearby at the time of building activities undertaken by Antiochus. So, to continue from the excavations that took place more than a hundred years ago, we possibly have two additional locations of early Christian activities, one in Insula 12, with a part of bronze candlestick and three oil lamps, all with monogram of Christ, and the other in Insula 30, with a large hall, both from 4th century. And from the latest excavations that are the subject of next lecture by my colleague Andre Gaspari, we have what seems to be an early Christian section of Emuna's Northern Cemetery with a central burial, followed by burials at Sanctos and an expanding architecture, possibly a chapel. Additionally, we have a rather controversial architecture near Emuna's Forum, uh, more than, than 30 meters in diameter large rotunda with marble capitals, controversial because it is dated to the 5th or even 6th century when traces of life in the Mona are really scarce. The rotunda was probably also a place for Christian rituals as it had a small pool adjacent. Other ecclesiastical artifacts from the second half of the 5th or even from the 6th century in Mona are fragments of glass lamps, once a part of Policandela. Two such fragments have been found in Insula 31 and one in Insula 32. The latter is the before-mentioned early Christian center, whereas the former, Insula 31, yielded no distinct several remains. But the rotunda and the glass lamps are supposedly from the time when life in the moon has slowly died down. Let us go back on more firm grounds to the 4th century. There we have, as already mentioned, parts of city moat neglected, but other previously filled up parts again in use, either for drainage or for the city protection or defense. For the same reason, some of the postern gates in the city walls were walled up. And from the second half of the 4th century, some parts of the sewer system were becoming increasingly neglected to the point of being hardly permeable in some spots by the mid-5th century. Besides, to keep listing on evidence for changing <coughs> attitudes towards secular buildings, the temple that stood on the forum was presumably, presumably demolished, and one of its stone slabs with a griffin, early imperial, was found in a well near the Forum in Insula 13. 
Why did all this happen, this change from the early infrastructure fully functioning, so to say classical Roman and Mona with its regularly maintained public buildings, into later Mona, a bit different in appearance and certainly also in function, uh, with several newly built and richly adorned early Christian buildings? First, uh, let us take a look at what could be termed the external factors, the external here meaning those outside of the city. Now, uh, this is a very complex theme and here I must simplify a lot. We have heard just previously a very thorough lecture on this subject. Let us just say that the late Roman Mona was a city in an increasingly fragmented and limited empire. Uh, due to external threats and invasions, the wider Emona's area became a part of East Alpine enclosures, but there was also <coughs> instability in the empire. And then we also have internal factors amongst those. Mostly the following should be underlined. A strong Christian community in Emona documented by architecture and also by those two hieronymous letters. A fact that the moon was a TUCZ from the 4th century on, and this, according to the better documented <coughs> examples from the Roman West, means that the bishop was on the rise to become one of the most powerful and influential figures in the city. What is characteristic for the contemporaneous cities in the Roman West, but is not detectable in the Mona, probably due to the early decline of the city, is a passing of a civic authority from Curialis to an undefined group of wealthy notables and then to the bishop. But we don't have this. So, I propose that uh, Christianization along with threatening armed conflicts should be seen as one of the main factors of urban transformation of when Mona we have described earlier. This was a very long process that took place in many of the cities in the Roman West, in the late Roman uh, West, in the late Roman period, and I assume also in the Mona. Let us take again a closer look. Um, what was happening in the cities in the Roman West in the late Roman period? As Christianity became legal, social life was gradually secularized, and the focus of public and private investments shifted from secular public buildings to Christian ones. Clearly, the attitude towards public buildings was changing, and we have seen this also for a Mona in a part. It is very important to know that this transformation of the Mona's appearance went hand in hand with a different way of life in the city. Uh, first, we must emphasize that the Roman city was not merely a physical structure or an administrative unit, but encompassed what Verdieu had called habitus, that is lifestyle, values, dispositions, expectations of its inhabitants and also inhabitants of its territory of its agar. In early Roman Amona, the practices of a Roman way of life, the manner of dining, sacrifices made to the gods, visiting public events, and included the spectacles, meetings of the city councils, public announcement, defined the Romanness of the people and the city. In late Roman Amora, there were Christian events to partake in, such as processions, masses, baptizing, different burial rites. Very soon, Amora grew to buildings and places necessary for this change and buildings no longer necessary were repurposed or neglected. Now the city public buildings and events, many of them Christian in character, were less and less financed by Hubertism in the traditional sense, but by church. The church was now slowly becoming one of the points of accumulation of wealth, and bishops and their assistants became one of the leading builders. Also in Amona, as the so-called building inscription in the portico of Amona's early Christian center attests. In that period, the administrative organization of the Western Roman city changed as well. With the political changes, the civic administration was weakened, and different forms of organization succeeded curial government. Soon, with the growth of church, the bishop emerged as the most powerful and most representative figure of the city. 
However, we do not see this in Amona. Although it was, as we have already heard, a bishopric from 380s to the end of the 6th century. So, to some, it is the different practices of daily life that gradually change the city, not only its appearance, but also its structure and function. But we must strongly emphasize the graduality of this process in Amuna. In 366, uh, in 376-77, when Hieronymus wrote now his famous letters to Amuna Virgines and monk Antonius, there was obviously already a strong Christian community in Amuna for some time. However, in 388, when Theodosius I arrived in Amuna, he was greeted by Curiales, and priests with little <coughs> cats and Dominus. Uh, those are both pagan priests. And curiously, our source, Pacatus, does not mention Christian priests. Although some Christian buildings must have already stood in Amun at the time, and the Christian burial grounds with its expanding chapel was presumably in use for decades. But, again, a considerable part of northern cemetery of Emona was still used for pagan burial in the second half of the 4th century, at least until the beginning and possibly up to the middle of the 5th century, with what seems to be pagan burials made according to Roman root. Still, a gradual degree to the secularization of social life in Emona is archaeologically documented. Uh, and, as I said, Christianization of people went hand in hand with Christianization of places and of culture. The character of urban life in Amuna and the city appearance was at least partially transformed as well as this society. To some, Roman Amuna was a product of Roman society and the place where this society lived and changed. One of the most obvious changes for Amuna was a gradual Christianization detectable archaeologically in the 4th century. I argued here that Christianization of Amuna was a process that went hand in hand with other processes that defined cities in the Roman West in the late Roman period. Simply, the character of cities in the Western Empire was changing at the time and Amuna did not fall behind. Thank you.